from Biorad headquarters, welcome to our Biomarkers podcast. I'm Laura Moriarty and I'm here in the Bioradiation studio here in Hercules, California. Joining us on the phone is Adam Carroll. He's the co-founder and chief scientific officer for Amplion. Amplion is based just up the coast from us in Oregon. Adam, can you please share a little with us about how Amplion got started? Uh, the founding of Amplion came out of, uh, of a my co-founder and I discussing uh, ways in which uh, knowledge-based type systems could be used to improve his role then. Uh, so he was the president of a uh, life sciences company, and they were interested in knowing um, what product they should make next. They're interested in seeing trends in the biomarker space, uh, understanding what kinds of molecules are being measured and for what purpose and how many people might be making similar measures in the future. And so the, the difficulty that we saw or the challenge that we, we sought to address was making it easier to get a look at the whole landscape for a particular biomarker or for a particular disease area at a glance. So pulling together diverse sources of information and putting them all together in one place, you could begin to watch uh, trends develop uh, keep an eye on something you thought was almost there but not quite there, having quite met your standards for something you were going to work on. Uh, and it's really sort of it continues to be that. Uh, our focus now is more on pharmaceutical companies than it is on life sciences companies. And the methods by which we put uh, data into the system have evolved um, from annual curation and review and then some sort of semi-automation to more full automation, and now the algorithms themselves have advanced from sort of simpler natural language processing algorithms into uh, artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, and deep learning type approaches. Uh, but our goal is still to make it easier for our clients and customers to get a look at everything that's going on, uh, rather than just as much as they can uh, can digest uh, in doing that research in a, in a manual fashion. And so the, the goal really is to help pharmaceutical companies in particular understand what biomarkers are either in clinical use and should be included in the trials that they're planning or um, emerging from earlier phase preclinical work and beginning to uh, appear uh, at that level of readiness, that level of maturity. Uh, I won't say validation because it's a little bit of a loaded term, but uh, you know, reaching that level of maturity to be something that they can include in their in their clinical trials. So we're really very focused on trying to uh, take all of that universe of information uh, and digest it on behalf of our customers so that they can uh, make use of that in planning their clinical trials. Oh. I see. So the outputs from Biomarker Base can really provide lots of great information for folks who are doing biomarker programs. Are biomarkers always going to be important for clinical trials? Uh, they are, always. Uh, it's interesting, that's been a, a slower evolution, uh, I think, than a lot of us who've been watching the field and interested in the field for a number of years. Uh, it, it's gone slow, more slowly than I think some of us would have would have liked to see, and there's some good reasons for that, right? Uh, being more precise means that you're not giving a medicine to folks that don't need it, which means inherently that your market is smaller. And so there's been some resistance, for sure. I see. Does this require a companion diagnostic to be created alongside a pharmaceutical? It doesn't necessarily. Certainly companies uh, see competitive advantages when they have a companion diagnostic, but that's not going to be necessarily necessary in absolutely every case. Uh, but we certainly see a role, particularly for um, new and emerging diseases that are, are being addressed for their sort of for the first time with effective therapies, essentially all of those are going to come to market with some kind of biomarker-based testing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's certainly uh, one, of, one of the interesting pieces of data that we've been able to gather uh, in collaboration with the biotechnology industry organization and, uh, and Informa is that we can show, combining data from some of Informa systems with ours, that clinical trials that do use biomarkers or uh, clinical programs that use biomarkers have a threefold higher chance of success over the entire clinical development process. That mm -hmm. number jumps from 8% to 24% uh, chance of success, and that's a, that's a huge difference. Uh, you know, and it, it speaks to uh, a really great need for enhanced molecular understanding of mm -hmm. the diseases that, that these therapeutics are addressing. 
uh, and the better you understand the disease, the better you're going to do in the clinical trial. Can you tell us more about the data incorporated into Biomarker Base? Where does it come from? What are the types of data that you use? Sure thing. Yeah. Uh, so the primary sources of data in Biomarker Base are public sources. Uh, so we include information about FDA cleared and approved tests. Uh, we include information about laboratory developed tests. So that is tests that are uh, not approved or cleared by the FDA, but are performed by CLIA certified laboratories to support clinical decision making. Uh, we also pull information from clinical trials uh, that are in the US clinical trials database as well as the EU's clinical trials database. We pull biomarkers from drug labels uh, for drugs approved in the United States. And we're just now moving into the space of extracting biomarker information from publications. And so those are, those are all public sources of information. Could you perhaps highlight some of the challenges that pharmaceutical companies may run into when they're incorporating biomarkers into the planning of their clinical trials? Certainly, I think the, the biggest challenge is starting early. Uh, a lot of times, um, you know, the, the cost of waiting a day in a clinical trial is, is enormous. Um, you know, you're eating into the patent lifespan of the molecule. You're, um, uh, the cost of capital is enormous. The faster you can get that drug to market, the better off you're going to be. So being able to make a fast, reliable, strategic decision about what biomarkers you want in that trial is the utmost importance to our customers in the pharma industry. Uh, so that sort of first step strategic uh, evaluation is something that we're hearing all the time is, is critical for folks. Uh, and there, there are definitely adverse consequences of neglecting that. Uh, we hear a lot of stories about companies with molecules in phase 2B that are starting to see indications that they might want a companion diagnostic. But of course, a lot of the data gathered from the earliest trials doesn't use, uh, um, isn't, isn't uh, being co-developed uh, in order to develop a companion diagnostic. And so you're really uh, several steps behind and have work to repeat at that point, which is, of course, uh, expensive as well. So starting early is probably the biggest uh, challenge that, that we hear about from our customers. Uh, you know, once these companies get rolling, uh, one of the things they want to keep an eye on too is what other companies are doing, because you're going to make a decision uh, about what biomarkers to include in your plan, uh, but then you're going to spend the next eight years executing that plan. A lot's going to change uh, in the landscape over those eight, eight years, and so being able to uh, surveil the landscape and see how it does change and how it changed specifically from the, the day on which you made your decision. That's a that's a valuable uh, piece of information too, and it's one that uh, the biomarker base is able to provide to folks. So, is this what you would consider the biomarker intelligence model? You know, looking at what's out there, what the trends are, and then how companies can incorporate that info into their clinical trial planning. That's absolutely right. Uh, you know, you you want to keep track of that from you know the cutting edge of science, if not the bleeding edge of science, you, know, you really want something that's, uh, that is you know, consistent with what key opinion leaders in the field are publishing and saying and, and seeing at conferences. Uh, and so the, you, you really do want uh, the smartest possible decision, but you also need to be able to take it all on board uh, when you know, the number of publications in your field might be more than a thousand. So what we're really focused on with our uh, artificial intelligence tools is and algorithms is to be generating uh, prioritized lists of what's the most important information, what what supports the case and what doesn't, and being able to extract that and prioritize these publications or trials based on uh, what's contained within them. Uh, that's that's real important work and saves a lot of time for folks in the pharmaceutical industry and adds a lot of value because it. Uh, places them in a position where uh, they can actually evaluate enough of the landscape uh, that they're confident they're not missing anything. How do folks use Biomarker Base? The, the way folks use our product is that you know they're going to be looking for um, you know how others have viewed this biomarker, uh, what's known about it, what's been published, uh, has it been used in other clinical trials before? If so, do those clinical trials have results, and what are they? Uh, is there already a test available for it? If there's an FDA cleared or approved test, that makes inclusion of it very easy, uh, you know, at least from the perspective of, you know, this is something you can purchase and, and run. 
Uh, and if it's not there, uh, how, how close is it to being ready for that? Is there a free lab that does offer an LDT, whether it's for that particular disease indication or not? Is there someone that can provide uh, a test that at least meets that sort of um, uh, meets that standard of uh, the fit for purpose standard of, uh, of what you want to go do with that? That, that can be a, a great accelerator and being able to quickly identify who those potential CLIA labs that might partner with you to process those samples. Uh, that's a that's a useful uh, partnering opportunity as well. Uh, and it lets you keep track of whether or not others uh, who are also pursuing molecules in that space and developing therapies in that space, if they're making the same measurements or not, uh, including those in their clinical trials. And so being able to keep track from a competitive perspective is this unique and, and uh uh, defining, and certainly you can hear that in pharmaceutical ads today. Uh, you know, uh, if you are uh, positive for PDL1, there is a specific drug that, uh, that uses the biological abbreviation for PDL1 in its you know direct to consumer advertising. So this is this is absolutely something that is uh, is right there at the forefront of uh, of what's going on and a, a big part of the, the national conversation about about biomarkers in, in clinical trials. So it's a Certainly, an exciting place to be, and an important place to be, because these these measurements not only confer a great a greater likelihood of success over the duration of the trial, but they can also confer a competitive advantage. It's going to give you uh, the opportunity to uh, carve out a market, and also an opportunity to speak to your market uh, in terms that uh, the American public is increasingly able to understand. Thanks, Adam. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with our audience today? intelligence and a lot of the uh, impacts that you're going to see from algorithms like the ones that we're building, uh, it's really going to change the face of life sciences and medicine over the next um, couple of decades. And we're, we're very excited to be part of that trend specifically um, and you know, really are taking advantage of a lot of the, the great advances that have happened within those fields uh, and are really very pleased and impressed with how much improvement that's able to make for us in terms of the quality of information that we're able to extract from the, uh, the massive amounts of, of, uh, of information that, that we see every day. So we're, we're really thrilled. Uh, it's, a, it's a great time to be alive, I guess, is <laughs> yeah, the right thing to say, because I think that there's an enormous amount to be learned from all of this information. And the fact of the matter is that put us in a great position to be able to help patients, right? Because that that's ultimately what gets us all uh, at Amplion fired up, uh, we're, we're working on something important. You know, the the fact of the matter, the, one of the questions that our CEO likes to uh, likes to raise is, you know, what if the cure for cancer existed and it was just buried in data that already exists? Uh, and so, being able to help our customers uh, mine that data uh, and find those insights that allow them to um, bring to market that drug that's going to be curative of some of these diseases. That's an enormously exciting opportunity. And so to be sort of at this intersection of uh, personalized medicine and uh, artificial intelligence, being able to contribute uh, to the decision making around that personalized medicine, we're, we're really excited. Uh, it's, a, it's a great time. It's a great time for Amplion and it's a great time for, uh, for people. Thanks so much, Adam, for joining us today. And thank you, folks, for listening. Stay tuned for other podcasts from BioRed Headquarters and the Bioradiations team. Bye-bye.